Hello everyone, um, I'm Trudaid. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I spend um, my time looking after a small group of engineers at um, Cloudflare, um, working on using kind of operations research um, solutions to improve the lives of customers. But um, in a previous life, I ended up finding myself in the high reliability world um, related to things like intelligent traffic systems and defense uh, projects. And a lot of the work I've actually done initially in my master's by research and then my uh, PhD, which I work on now, the applications have been in high reliability systems. And one of the things I found out was a lot of the tools we have um, in the high reliability world are often missing from um, the kind of, um, um, I won't, won't say the kind of um, Silicon Valley type companies, but just generally across the field. So initially, we know that software does kill people. This is actually a case from Oklahoma um, of the Toyota um, unaccelerated acceleration bug. It's related to some firmware, and effectively what, we, um, what they saw in this case was um, someone would be driving along in their car. Their car would behave like the accelerator pedal was pushed down. They couldn't operate the brakes. And the only way they could really save themselves in time was if they knew to um, disable the ignition. Um, and this ended up being a legal case um, in Oklahoma. And there was, um, in the testimony, there's a bar te uh, the bar group gave a testimony um, over this, and they found some quite disturbing examples of um, software patterns here, things like violations of the uh, MISRA C rules, which are usually used in um, the traffic sector. There were problems around um, the use of recursion, which generally shouldn't be used in high reliability embedded software and things like this. Uh, and actually, even coming to this was quite difficult because the US Road Authority, who was set to investigate this, didn't even have the ability to, uh, they didn't have any software engineers. They had to try and get NASA in, and even still they weren't able to pick up on all the issues. It was only at this very late stage kind of legal proceedings that things came out. And there were um, some other things brought up. You can see here things like spaghetti code. They had to explain all these concepts to a kind of lay jury. And of course, when you need to do that, dinosaurs really do help. Um, but in contrast to this, we actually do know that high reliability software is possible. If we look at Tokenir, which was a system developed by Altran for the NSA in the US, it's kind of an authentication system. They wrote this in um, Spark, which is kind of a subset of ADA, which is formally verified. And um, they open sourced this and gave it to researchers to try and see if they could identify bugs and they were only able to find um, four defects after very, very rigorous um, review by a lot of different researchers. In practice, everyone who flew here used um, high reliability software to a certain extent. Uh, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, 6.5 million lines of code, um, ADA on a um, real-time operating system. If we look at the Trident nuclear project, the Trident nuclear submarines in the US, or in the UK rather, um, the uh, submarine command system was written in ADA, but they were actually able to take the software and deploy it on commercially available hardware. So um, effectively off-the-shelf kind of Intel computers uh, because the software was written in such a rigorous fashion. And actually, I think it runs on uh, Windows nowadays, a modified version of Windows, which is fairly remarkable when you think of um, something like that. But there are other examples. There, there has recently been a case, I'm sure you've all heard, about um, aviation software. This was a case from a while ago of a Qantas flight um, where, in effect, uh, they were um, flying about five degrees over the horizon and the plane decided to enter. Um, a, it, got the, um, it thought it was going to stall, so it pitched a nose down and sped up. Um, which was fairly disastrous. There were some underlying kind of hardware issues, but ultimately it was, this was fixed in software. So this is kind of a case of where 
things can still happen, but we're at a state right now where the software is actually more reliable um, than the hardware in many cases, and taking control uh, um, of, in fact, uh, pilot behavior and giving, them more, uh, and giving the software more control has actually sh uh, shown to be positive. And this is something which is fairly remarkable when we think about it. We've actually shown that we can get to a stage that software can be very, very reliable um, and in many cases can be trusted better than um, human pilots and better than traditional kind of um, uh, mechanical engineering. So one of the things in the Toyota case which came out was around safety culture. And I think this kind of goes to the heart of the issue. The fundamental issue was that they didn't have safety culture as part of their, um, as part of their organization's um, culture and their environment. And um, it specifically says in an email they quoted, um, the truth is, uh, um, in truth, uh, technology such as failsafe is not part of the Toyota engineering division's DNA. And I think this is something for us all to reflect on, really, and think about when we talk about safety, we shouldn't really accept um, current norms, and this is vital as more and more of our work um, outside what we traditionally call high-integrity engineering becomes more and more vital. So with that, I'm going to shift gears and talk about implementing one of the patterns from the high-integrity world, one of the very simple patterns into um, a web API scenario. I'm going to kind of talk through this situation. So how do we go about monitoring um, web APIs? When we think about the software that we, um, that we deploy, uh, suppose you know, we um, will build a, a web service of some description, we'll put it up uh, in a service on Kubernetes. How do we monitor that? So we could set up Prometheus to do some, um, you know, uh, to, to monitor the service for elevated rates of errors. We could do smoke tests where we do mock API requests. But is that really enough? What, what happens in situations where the service is causing errors but it thinks it's behaving normally? What about integrity issues which are actually in the software itself, which aren't necessarily related to uptime but are specifically to do with the integrity of an application? And this is where I kind of want to head into design by contract. So design by contract, this, is, this language here is the Eiffel programming language. Um, it's kind of designed by Bertrand Mayer. And there are a few different blocks to this software. So we've got um, a kind of method here, which is a, um, an insertion kind of algorithm, with, which doesn't have an implementation. But it has a require block. That require block is um, effectively what we call a precondition. It's something that needs to be true for the application or the, um, the function in this case to be able to run for whatever is in that um, do block. If those conditions aren't met, then the do block should not be executed. And then we have an ensure uh, statement after that. That's a post condition. And the post condition is there to ensure that the application or the um, bit of code in the do block has actually executed itself correctly. Um, and if there's a violation of this, then we know the software kind of isn't functioning as it ordinarily should be. Um, there is another kind of contract rule which can be applied. There is a loop invariant, um, and that is, um, forms part of what we call a whore triple, um, which can be used for things like formal verification, but I'm not really going to dwell on that here. Then there's a the question of how we actually handle things when the contract rules are violated. Um, so this is actually a quote from a paper written by Bertrand Mayer, and he talks about um, the, a, 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 a kind of a program which calculates square roots in, um, in ADA, and how in, when you look at textbook examples, they teach engineers about exceptions to simply kind of, you know, the examples they give are how to ignore them, you know, print out the error and ignore them, which isn't a good idea when the typical use of a square root in an ADA program is missile trajectory computation. But there are questions still about how, um, how we should use design by contract. 
So in development environments, we're quite fortunate. We can just run the tests. If something fails, it fails in quite a brutal manner, um, and we know it's gone wrong. In languages like Ada, we can use, uh, or in Spark rather, we can use formal verification to prove that those contracts are met. But in many other situations, the contracts are simply disabled in production environments. There are two kind of reasons for this. There's the performance elements, um, which I don't think is that relevant, particularly nowadays. And then there's the other aspect of simply not wanting to have users, you know, see brutal error messages or their application fail just because a contract has been violated. Um, so often this data is simply discarded. And this kind of doesn't work in the modern day situation. So I'm going to talk about an example of how in Go we can kind of use uh, design by contract but use it in a more productive way. So this here is a, um, a simple example of, a, uh, of using a library, Go by contract, um, to enforce design by contract. So as you can see, there's two really simple arguments. There's a first parameter which can compute to be true or false, a second parameter which is a description of the contract. And the require represents a precondition, the ensure represents a postcondition. Um, and then we have a, a, um, some code in the middle. We're using the named return uh, variable in Go to just return what comes out, but you could probably do this in a similar way using defer, you could abstract out the logic in the middle to a private function if you wanted. Another kind of example of this is a time converter example, which is probably more uh, practical. And here you can see a requirement is made that the amount of seconds that is input must be positive, the method runs, and then there's post conditions to ensure things like the outputs. Um, the output number of minutes is zero or more, the remaining seconds is zero or more and that we, aren't put, uh, we don't have more than 60 uh, redundant seconds. But when this fails, um, we get a panic. We get quite a brutal panic, and it says the input seconds must be positive. And you can think of examples, though, where you wouldn't want users to have to experience these types of error messages. They're things you'd want to keep private, and that's why it's kind of become practice in design by contract behaviors to completely um, disable um, contract validation in production environments, even though we see examples of, uh, you know, we only see limited um, amounts of test data in private environments. So this kind of binding here also has a simple demonstration of how we can get around this problem, because nowadays we have things like, um, in this case, uh, error management tools like Sentry, which means we can simply pipe um, the contract violations which occur in a production environment to a tool like Sentry, we can look through them later and we can get to a situation where we still receive that kind of valuable information um, without it being completely discarded and that kind of works quite well when we look at environments um, which are iterating quite quickly um, and the testing won't really be as rigorous at um, the kind of initial stage of development. That's one thing, and it's, uh, we're talking really about um, a software pattern there and, it, it, uh, and using it in a situation where it's quite limited to a small application uh, um, and on a kind of function-by-function -function basis. I want to talk about how we can implement this on a wider footing for API services and how we can use this to overcome um, some kind of broader challenges around integrity. So I'm just going to demonstrate a really simple integrity violation in an, in an application. We have a simple users API. There's three endpoints, a get request that lists all the users, a get request which is um, you can get by username and a post um, condition to create a new user. We can list all users. Um, we can just fire off a curl request um, with a content type of application JSON, pipe that into JQ, and we get some pretty um, you know, a, a, a results of um, some JSON with some users' information. But this application contains a flaw. You, you can create a duplicate um, user. Now, this is ordinarily the type of thing which you can trivially, you, you can deal with this integrity problem at a database level. But in many cases, you can think of other integrity problems where um, the database alone couldn't handle them. 
Um, but just to keep it simple, I'm just going to use this example here. So then when we do another get request, we can see there's a duplicate, um, there's duplicate usernames here for IC April across multiple different records. Now, it's actually fairly easy to compose a contract to get around this problem. The precondition here is that the, um, we do a HTTP request and we see that um, the result uh, should be a 404. It shouldn't, the, it shouldn't exist um, when we check if it's there. And then the post condition is just to check if it is there. And you can compose contracts in a way where when you think about things like um, concurrency, where that isn't ordinarily an issue. So things like, um, in this case, the input is for, uh, you know, we check it doesn't exist at the beginning, and then afterwards we check it does exist. And we leave the kind of um, consistency problems down to the uh, database level, and if necessary, the kind of message queue application layer. Um, Again, these contracts aren't there to solve those fundamental problems. They're, they're there to be an alerting sign for when things are going wrong. Um, um, so in order for us to implement this, we can actually use Go's reverse proxy behavior. So I've set up a simple HTTP client. I don't expect you to read all the code here, but what I uh, want to kind of dwell on is on the right-hand side, the request handler there. We've set kind of an upstream API, and we've determined when there's a post request here to the user's endpoint, this is when we run the contracts. And there's just some um, kind of work with the buffer there to make sure that it, um, uh, you know, the closer, uh, that um, the buffer doesn't close really when, uh, when we read the content, so we can do contracts. And then all we do is we run the preconditions, we defer the post condition to be run later, it will make the uh, reverse proxy behavior, and then it will fire back with whatever, um, whatever we need on that front, and it will indicate whether there's been a violation or not. But by combining the ability for us to report um, errors into an environment like Sentry, we're able to get to a situation where we can set an environment variable, in this case, um, don't panic, set to true. We're able to set where we should report these errors in Sentry, and then we're able to report these contract violations. So we're actually able to move um, issues around integrity and um, solve them at a reverse proxy layer instead. So I've gone through that quite quickly. Um, uh, the other thing I w should qu um, add to this is where, um, when we actually look at the reverse proxy behavior in, in this typical example here, some people would say, well, aren't we introducing additional complexity into this situation here? Um, aren't we introducing another service that can go down? The thing I would add about that is it is actually relatively easy to overcome issues around application reliability. We have load balancing. Um, we have Kubernetes. We have other systems which can address the kind of bread and butter of keeping a service up. This allows us to enter the kind of integrity space and move the integrity problems to a different domain effectively. So, thank you. I, I wonder if we've got any time for questions. <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for about uh, one or two questions. Okay, so the first question is, should we validate parameters only inside the function, only in the caller, or inside the function plus the caller? Yes, there's two different kind of domains. There's designed by contract and then there's defensive programming. Designed by contract is uh, this kind of approach where we determine that it is down to the receiver and if, if, it's, if, the, if the function gets something which is a violation, it will flag up as an error. Defensive programming is more where we program in a way where we are tolerant to the input that is received. And I don't think these are mutually exclusive in these situations. We can use uh, designed by contract situations to alert ourselves to errors, but we can also have the low-lying application code in something which is um, a bit more defensively designed. Okay, uh, so the next question is, what are some tools we can use to bring formal verification along the line of TLA plus to go? Yes. So. This is a tough question. I think it's something which the Rust community have also been attempting to do, but um, I don't think 
they've really made sufficient progress. I think the, the only real example I've I've seen so far has been the Ada Core team. Uh, I mean, the example which is used in kind of real life production code where formal verification is necessary. I, I, the dominant player is clearly the um, Ada Core team and the um, NAT compiler with NAT Verify. And there is definitely work where that needs to be moved more downstream into, um, into other programming languages. And I think that's definitely an area which, uh, where investment um, can be put in. Um, I think in terms of, th there is some challenges if you want to go down the route of formal verification through design by contract in Go, because we don't have native kind of annotations in the language, um, which means that th there can be some additional complexity there. But I don't think it, it would be too brutal for someone to overcome if, they if they've exposed themselves to um, implementations of formal verification in the past. Yeah, we have time for one more, one more last question. Does tracing helps to increase reliability? Does tracing? Does tracing helps to increase reliability? Um, I can't really comment on that too much. Uh, my, my kind of um, background in the past has been to address the reliability questions kind of as early on as you can in the process. So things like um, there are very, very formal processes um, to developing highly reliable software when we look at things like the reveal process and um, those types of process which address these questions as early on as you can. Then you come up with the formal specification, you translate that into things more downstream and you get to a solution where those types of things aren't really necessary. Um, but how that works in a production environment, I'd say I'm not really experienced enough to dwell too much on, on that question. Perfect, thank you.